All right, how's everybody doing? Hotep. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. Uh, we are live. It is Wednesday, March 21st, 2018. And uh, we are live right now. And we should be broadcasting on Facebook Live also, our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network on Facebook, all right? All right, so it's the second day of spring. And uh, I wanted to talk about this topic. Uh, I talked about some Sunday night on uh, my radio show, The African History Network show. It's uh, dealing with the film Black Panther, and it's dealing with how the film Black Panther is sparking a, um, a black money movement in Brazil. How the film Black Panther is sparking a black money movement uh, in Brazil. And it's a fantastic, fantastic story. I've seen um, three articles, at least three articles um, dealing with this, okay? So um, everybody share this broadcast on your own Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in also. All right, share this broadcast on your own Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in as well. All right, and um, be sure to follow our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, okay? And then also we'll talk some about the uh, online class I'm doing on Saturday, March 31st, 2018, 2 p.m. to uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, dealing with the film uh, Black Panther, okay? Uh, so you can uh, register for that at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, all right? Okay, and let me pin this right here so it stops moving. All right, so um, there's an article from AtlantaBlackStar.com that they picked up from QZ Africa, QZ, uh, QZ Africa, Quartz Africa, that uh, talks about of the impact that the film Black Panther is having in Brazil, okay? And uh, you may have seen some of our articles that we've posted here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, dealing with Brazil. We know the population of Brazil is a little over 200 million, about 51, 52% of the Brazilian population is uh, people of African descent. Actually, they're, they're either mixed uh, or they're, uh, they're or Afro-Brazilians or what have you, okay? Uh, and then also, I'm going to tell you uh, about um, a lecture I'm doing at Wayne State University uh, Thursday, March 22nd. Thursday, March 22nd, 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Uh, in the old main building, Wayne State University in Detroit, okay? Uh, we have that information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and also we'll talk about me uh, in Baltimore, Saturday, April, and uh, Saturday, uh, April 7th, to Sunday, April 8th, at the um, at the 17th Annual Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo. So the self-sufficiency that uh, was exhibited in the film Black Panther uh, in the uh, fictitious African nation of Wakanda has inspired thousands of Afro-Brazilians to look to their own for economic and entrepreneurial uh, support, okay? So as a nation of over 100 million black and brown people, Brazil stands as one of the top five international markets for uh, the blockbuster film Black Panther, which has uh, to date raked in about, about 1.3 billion. It's over the 1 billion mark nationwide. And this film, uh, is doing very well overseas, even in China, uh, even though there was some um, uh, negative comments from some Chinese uh, viewers that the film was too black. Uh, opening day a couple of Fridays ago in China did almost $20 million uh, opening day. And that opening weekend, it did about $63 million in China. OK, so it's, it's doing phenomenally uh, worldwide, which is really good because one of the drawbacks, one of the criticisms uh, or excuses given by Hollywood not to have uh, movies with a predominantly African-American cast is that they don't sell well overseas. They don't market well overseas. Okay. But uh, the film Black Panther 
is uh, proving that to be wrong. Now, Afro-Brazilians have organized all black screenings of the film Black Panther uh, in cities nationwide, such as a group in Sao uh, Paulo uh, in Brazil, whose private showing featured marketing uh, for, Af for black owned businesses rather than previews for upcoming films. So when you go to the movie, you know, you see all these previews. I think when I went to go see, I've seen Black Panther twice. I'll probably go see it again tomorrow because I'm doing a, a, a short presentation uh, on Thursday, uh, March 22nd at Wayne State University dealing with the film Black Panther. So I'll probably go see it again tomorrow. But when I went to go see it, they showed about 10 minutes of coming attractions and previews of uh, upcoming movies, right? So what they did at this screening, at this all black screening in Brazil, is they promoted black owned businesses, okay? Uh, uh, instead of showing previews of upcoming films. Now, meanwhile, in Rio de Janeiro, black Brazilians or Afro Brazilians held what is called Rosinos, Rosinos, R-O-L-E, Z-I-N-H-O-S, Rosinos, at shopping malls usually reserved for the white elite as a way to protest racial exclusion, as a way to protest racial exclusion. So um, many of you saw the articles and the coverage we've done on the um, uh, Afro-Brazilian uh, city councilwoman, um, Marielle Franco, uh, who was assassinated March 14th. And we've seen various stories leading up to that, that deals with the rapid racism that takes place uh, uh, in Brazil against Afro-Brazilians, right? So the root.com had a really good article uh, talking about the protests of uh, that black Brazilians are engaging in, in white spaces. Uh, black Panther inspires black Brazilians to occupy white dominant spaces, okay? Uh, black Panther inspires black Brazilians to occupy white dominant spaces. And in, in this article here, it talks about how uh, a recent uh, article from The Intercept, the publication, theintercept.com, explains that the influence uh, of the film Black Panther has shown up in Brazil in the form of uh, what are known as Rosino Pretoi, P-R-E-T-O-I, Rosino Pretoi, which roughly translates as uh, roughly translates uh, as a Black Stroll, S-T-R-O-L-L, -L, Black Stroll. OK. And uh, what happens is, is Afro-Brazilians get together in large groups. And they they turn up together. They, they 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 come out and they walk around in areas that uh, are largely reserved for white people. Okay, uh, the stroll has a recent history of being a form of protest in Brazil. Now, in the article from the Intercept, one group of Afro Brazilians coordinated a a Ros Rosino to watch the film Black Panther at one of Rio de Janeiro's most exclusive high-end shopping malls. Uh, the shopping mall is called Leblon, L-E-B-L-O-N, okay? Uh, Leblon, all right? And, um, okay, so they showed up at Leblon, uh, as, uh, and uh, Leblon is couched, this shopping mall is couched in one of the most affluent areas in Brazil, and is also uh, a predominantly white space in a country where the majority of the population now identifies as black, as black or as black or mixed race. OK, the majority of the population in Brazil identifies as uh, black or mixed race. All right. So this made the uh, screening of the film Black Panther as much uh, of a political act as a celebration as well. So when, when you look at this film, this film is having a big impact on African people throughout the diaspora. All right. So the article from The Intercept goes on to say that organizers would start an event on Facebook and call for everyone to meet at a certain mall at a certain time. Young, mostly dark skinned residents of the city's poor and working class neighborhoods on the urban periphery would uh, take a sometimes one or two hour train or bus ride to shopping centers 
in the bougiest enclaves and just go for a walk about, just walk around, okay? They are purposely inserting themselves into these white, exclusive, white, affluent areas. Now, in some cases, thousands of, uh, of Afro-Brazilians will show up, much to the horror of Brazil's white elite, whose ever-present racial and class-based fears were palpable. Malls, including the exclusive shopping mall LeBlanc, closed down in anticipation of these protests. Others were broken up, other, other protests were broken up with tear gas and rubber bullets. Now, one of the things that Marielle Franco was protesting about and others in, in Brazil, other Afro-Brazilians there in Brazil, are protesting against the mistreatment of Afro-Brazilians by the police, just like many of us are mistreated by the police here in the U.S. So the Rosino for the uh, global blockbuster film Black Panther then was a way to celebrate blackness in a highly visible way to reclaim a highly segregated and exclusive space. So oftentimes, you know, I've seen a lot of Facebook threads, Facebook posts. I've read about 100 articles um, dealing with the film Black Panther. Like I said, I'm, I'm um, doing an online class dealing with the film Black Panther uh, Saturday, March 31st, 2018, 2 p.m. to um, 4 p.m. At, at our online school, the African History Network School. So I'm working on the presentation now. And uh, oftentimes I'll hear people say things like, oh, well, it's just a movie. It's just a movie, right? Well, you, th these people don't understand how media impacts the way you think, feel, act, and behave. Media impacts the way you think, feel, act, and behave. Your thoughts create feelings. Your feelings create actions and behaviors. Your actions and behaviors create results, okay? Everything that you learn, everything that you know, most likely you either read it, you heard it, uh, or you felt it or something. But what you read, see, and hear influences the way you think, feel, act, and behave, okay? So we, so we have to understand the power of media. And, and we have to understand how it can be used for good and how it can be used for bad. All right. Unfortunately, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the images that we see of ourselves in the media are negative images. And this influences the way we think about ourselves, the way we feel about ourselves, et cetera. It influences the way other people treat us also. OK, your thoughts create feelings. Your feelings create actions and behaviors. Your actions and behaviors create results. Your thoughts create feelings. Your feelings create actions and behaviors. Your actions and behaviors create results. OK, so so we have to understand the, the power of media and you're going to see a change in some of the types of uh, films that are coming out of Hollywood because of the overwhelming uh, success that the film Black Panther is having. And is showing that there's a market for uh, a positive uh, whether it's Afrofuturism, whether it's African culture type films, historical type films, other than slave movies, because a lot of uh, a lot of African Americans have expressed that they're tired of uh, slave movies. Okay, and the film Black Panther is showing that there is a market for uh, other types of historical films other than slave movies. Now, yes, slavery is part of our history, et cetera, right? But it's not the only part of our history. And oftentimes, movies about slavery are told to the uh, detriment and at the expense of other uh, types of movies dealing with our history, either prior to slavery existing or even triumphant movies like the one that's coming out um, with Vi Viola Davis and Lapita Nyong'o about the uh, African warrior, African female warriors of Dahomey. Okay, I think it's called The Woman King. Uh, that's a film coming out about the Mino, these African female warriors uh, in um, amongst the foe people in Dahomey in West Africa, which is now modern day Benin. And this is, is largely believed these are the uh, African female warriors that the Dora Malaji 
in the film Black Panther, those female warriors is 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 largely believed that these African female warriors from Dahomey are who the the Dora Milaje are based upon. This is real history, okay? So you, you so this this is really powerful. All right, so how's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your own Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. Also, I posted the link there for the uh, our six course online bundle pack. You can. Uh, order six of my online courses. Uh, they're all on demand except the one for Black Panther, the one for Black Panther, Saturday, March 31st, all right? They, and that's in that bundle pack also. Okay, so um, the Rosino or the Black Stroll, okay, this type of protest where afro Brazilians get together and go into white spaces. The Rosino for the global blockbuster film Black Panther then was a way to celebrate blackness in a highly visible way to reclaim a law, a highly segregated and exclusive space. Now, Ronaldo Jr., who's an actor, the Afro-Brazilian actor, participated in a recent Rosino, okay? And he was interviewed by The Intercept, the news publication, news website, The Intercept. He said, quote, we wanted to occupy this space to say we are alive, end quote. We wanted to occupy this space to say we are alive, end quote, okay? He went on to say, uh, now um, you had another um, uh, Afro-Brazilian named uh, Luc Lucino uh, uh, Juniaro, okay? J-A-N-U-A-R-I-O. And he said, quote, we almost never see any of our people in this kind of space. We almost never see any of our people in this kind of space. It's as though this space is only meant for white people. So when we have a film written by written by a black man with black actors and black producers, we felt it was our duty to occupy this space so we could serve as an example. So, th so, so this is this is an example of the impact that this film is having in Brazil. And Afro-Brazilians largely know more about their history than African-Americans know about our history. And this is the type of impact that it's having. Now, you have another Afro-Brazilian who's 28, who's a 28 year old student named Igor Marino, Marino, M-R-A-M-A-R-I-N-H-O, Igor Marino, Y-G-O-R, I guess it's pronounced Igor. And he participated in a recent Rosino or Black Stroll. And he watched the film Black Panther for the first time. And he said that the movie's black majority cast filled him with pride. He said the movie's black majority cast filled him with pride. He said that, quote, it makes me want to win. It makes me want to fight. It makes me like myself more like my own skin tone, like my kind of hair, like the shape of my nose, like the shape of my lips, like myself more. So we see this film that has largely dark skinned African people in an African American, and I don't have a problem with that. We see beautiful African women, African American women, no palms. The only only sister really who had a palm was Nightshade. Nightshade was the girlfriend of Killmonger. Nightshade is straight out of the comic book. To understand the film, you have to understand the Black Panther comic book. This is one of the things I'm going to do in, in my online class is give some background information of the movie, of the characters, because you have to understand the comic book. Because I see a lot of comments on social media criticizing the film. And these are people who don't understand the Black Panther comic book and haven't researched it. So one of the things I've been doing is researching the Black Panther comic book and the different storylines. OK, but you see all these African women with natural hair or they're bald. And the bald, the sisters who are bald, they look beautiful also. So Igor Marino uh, goes on to say, because you start to see people who are like you and you see how they carry themselves empowered happy with themselves, and you start to like yourself better, okay? Well, this is the power of media. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, 
And what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you have been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. This is the power of media. This is why you had negative stereotypical images of African-Americans that were created, created by Europeans. They were created to justify slavery. You had negative images prior to slavery. You had a dehumanization of African people. You had an attack on the Moors who are in Europe, the 800 year occupation of the Moors. And the way that they were depicted was changed and, and their images are going to be attacked. They're going to be dehumanized. This leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Africans being relabeled as savages and subhuman. OK, and saying that we were pagan because we were not, quote unquote, Christians. But when you study the history of Christianity, they took fragments from the periphery of African spiritual systems to create Christianity. And you study the uh, story of Asara, Aset, and Heru, the first Holy Trinity. This, this story of this immaculate conception, this virgin birth, goes back to at least 3300 BC in ancient Nubia, Ta-Nehisi. You can read Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Brown. He deals with this in the book. So because of a rise of white supremacy and a rise in the European phenotype, you have a rise in European culture, a rise in European images. And then you have a rewriting of history. Uh, Europeans coming out of the Dark Ages, late 1400s, early 1500s. And then you have a uh, uh, deep, then you have a uh, um, a depigmentation of these traditional African characters, of these traditional African figures, like the Black Madonna and Child becomes the White Mary and Jesus. Michelangelo paid in the Sistine Chapel and using Europeans as the model for for God and Adam and Eve and all different types of things like this. So we so we have to understand a, a a chronology of history and understand how a sequence of historical events lead up to another historical event, a larger historical event taking place. OK, so so that was the article from the root dot com. Uh, Black Panther inspired black Brazilians to occupy white dominant spaces. Right. So not only are they dominant, uh, occupying white dominant spaces, but it is causing a black money movement to take place in Brazil as well, which is fantastic also. Okay, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your own Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in also. And then uh, we have the information there on the thread of the broadcast and in the description about the uh, online courses I teach in the upcoming uh, Black Panther online lecture that I'm doing at an online school Saturday, uh, Saturday, March 31st, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can watch from anywhere around the world. OK, so if we go back to this article from AtlantaBlackStar.com, how Marvel's Black Panther is inspiring a black money movement in Brazil. And they talk about how the film's success has sparked a movement representing the idea that Afro-Brazilians can use their funds, use their funds, use their money to support black businesses. An idea that's gaining steam and has even crossed into the mainstream media. Now, Rodrigo Franca, F-R-A-N-C-A, Rodrigo, Rod, Rodrigo Franca is an actor who organized an all-black viewing of the film Black Panther in Rio de Janeiro. He told Quartz Africa, QZ uh, Africa, Quartz Africa, uh, he said, quote, for us, the success of Black Panther was a grand example of how much we have to consume and it also showed the potential. It also showed the potential of how we can consume products that are related to our representation, products that will also respect our culture. He said, now check this out. Now, this is the brother, this is an Afro-Brazilian brother in Brazil. Now, Brazil, people have to understand. Brazil has the largest population of African people outside the continent of Africa. They have a little more than 100 million. And most Afro-Brazilians know more about their history than African-Americans know about ours. He said, quote, if we stop buying 
from racist companies and companies that do not engage in diversity, those companies will not survive. He said, if we stop buying from racist companies and companies that do not engage in diversity, those companies will not survive. Now, the idea of Afro-Brazilians pulling their money together to support something that's black or black owned is not as common, but the tides are changing because white supremacy is a global system. So even though they're the majority population there, they're still dealing with white supremacy and racism. Now, Rodrigo Franco went on to say, quote, we don't have this culture for money to leave black hands and go directly into another black person's hands. Due to the myth of the racial democracy, some black people think it doesn't matter if they support black products. Now, you can, you can apply this to some people in African-Americans in Detroit or Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or whatever city that you're in. But this is a brother in Brazil saying this. Quote, due to the myth of the racial democracy, some black people think it doesn't matter if they support black products, quote unquote. Now, black Brazilians or Afro-Brazilians hold both economic and entrepreneurial potential as black folks comprise the majority of business owners in Brazil. Most, most of these businesses are one person businesses, just like they are here in the U.S., you, as of 2012, you had 2.6 million African American owned businesses. About 95% only had, you know, one employee, the owner. Doesn't mean we shouldn't support them. Doesn't mean that they can't. It doesn't mean that they can't provide services, or doesn't mean that they're not important in the community. Just means they need. We have to support them more so they can grow and hire more people. So you see some similarities between the Afro-Brazilians and African-Americans. Black Brazilians hold both economic and entrepreneurial potential as uh, black folks comprise the majority of business owners in Brazil. Most are one person, one person businesses. However, as black people have historically been shut out from building wealth via large scale entrepreneurship, simply because they lack the capital and access to funds to do so, Quartz Africa reported. Okay? Black people have historically been shut out from building wealth via large-scale entrepreneurship simply because they lack the capital and access to funds to do so. Now, the Black Money Movement is now hoping to change that. Now, um, Dais Rosas Natividad, uh, D-A-I-S-C, is the founder of Black Pages Brazil. Black Pages Brazil, okay? And Black Pages Brazil, if I remember correctly, this is like a uh, Airbnb. This is like a Afro-Brazilian version of Airbnb. Let me look at the article from... Uh, uh, the uh, courts, uh, courts Africa and uh, Black Pages Brazil. So uh, she's the founder of Black Pages Brazil. It was founded in 1993. And she says interest in black entrepreneurship among Afro Brazilians has surged in the recent years because of several factors. The introduction of affirmative action in universities has led to more college educated Afro Brazilians who are conscious about racial issues, okay? A beauty movement that promotes a positive black aesthetic has helped some Afro-Brazilians have higher self-esteem, she said. Now, now, just look at this. In, in Brazil, which is more than 51% Afro-Brazilian, you have to have a black beauty movement so that Afro-Brazilians feel comfortable about being black because white supremacy is a global system. And what the, what, what the white control media does, it's a, it's a global system and white control media promotes images of Europeans and 
it uses a European standard of beauty. So we look in South Africa, we look in Nigeria, we look in Caribbean countries like Haiti, Dominican Republic. You have brothers and sisters there using skin bleaching creams. You have brothers and sisters there using skin bleaching creams so they can look more European. So, so, so this is the type of power that the film Black Panther is having. This is the type of power that the film Black Panthers have. This is why when I hear people say it's just a movie, it's fantasy. Oh, it's based upon a comic book. Yes, yeah, based upon a comic book. But what you read, see, and hear affects the way you think, feel, act, and behave. You have to understand the power of media. I've been studying media for 25 years. You have to understand the power of media. Your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. So a beauty movement that promotes a positive black aesthetic has helped some afro Brazilians have higher self-esteem. Today, knowledge and opinions on black issues spread fast through social media networks. But um, uh, Daís, uh, the founder of Black Pages Brazil, she thinks the film Black Panther tipped the conversation about black money and economic power over the ledge. She said, quote, the entrance of a film like Black Panther created a positive space where people could start to think positively about black money. The entrance of a film like Black Panther created the positive space where people could start to think positively about black money. Because, see, the, the, the fictitious nation of Wakanda is a nation that was never colonized by Europeans. It was never conquered by Europeans. So what it also did is show Africans throughout the diaspora what Africa could look like if our history had not been interrupted by slavery and colonialism. It, 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 it showed African people throughout the diaspora what, our, what Africa could look like if our history had not been interrupted by slavery and colonialism. And I have numerous articles and I've read numerous articles that talk about the economic impact that is having with various African-American owned businesses also. Businesses that sell African, African garb and African books and all different types of things like this. When you look at the, we're going into the summer season where we have a lot of conferences, right? You have some uh, African-American comic book conferences coming up, Afrofusion conferences. There's a, there's a Wakanda conference that's gonna take place in uh, Chicago. And I think it's either April or May. There's a Wakanda conference that's going to take place in Chicago. This thing is huge. Now, um, so black. So let's see here. Um, black Pages Brazil. Black Pages Brazil. I guess this is like a a, um, a Afro Brazilian like business directory, something like that, right? You have another business called diaspora.black, diaspora.black. And this is a Brazilian startup marketing itself as a black Airbnb. Now, this business just concluded a crowdfunding campaign in which it raised more than $5,000. So this year, 2018, the startup will participate in uh, an accelerator uh, supported by Facebook in Sao, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. In 2017, social entrepreneur Paulo Rogerio, R-O-G-E-R-I-O, Paulo Rogerio launched Dende Valley, D-E-N-D-E, D-E-N-D-E, Dende Valley, which is an accelerator that will nurture the creative economy of black entrepreneurs in the city of Salvador in um, Brazil. Now, more than 80% of Salvador's 3 million people identify as black, making it Brazil's blackest large city. So Rogério, Paulo, uh, Paulo Rogério wants Salvador to be the Atlanta of Brazil. And 
And Salvador is, is uh, Brazil's capital of black entrepreneurship, uh, creativity and consumption. She wants it to be the Atlanta of Brazil. He said that, um, quote, black money is a movement to increase black economic empowerment and black connections. Black money is a movement to increase black economic empowerment and black connections. Now, he was the only Afro-Brazilian invited to lunch with President Barack Obama when President Obama uh, visited Brazil in October 2017. He said, quote, with Black Panther, Black people in Brazil are finally starting to think that they uh, do big things on a major scale. He said, with Black Panther, with the film Black Panther, the people are saying it's just a movie, it's based upon a comic book, it's fantasy, it's not real. He said, Black people in Brazil are finally starting to think that they do big things on a major scale. This is the power image. This is why we need to see more positive movies like Black Panther. There are they're, they're an endless number of stories to tell, historical stories, fantasy, et cetera. Because even in fiction, there's reality even in fiction. Now, some Black entrepreneurs are hesitant to celebrate this, mo this moment so early. Aline Lorena, L-O-U-R-E-N-A, started her communications agency 10 years ago. And while large companies and while large companies um, like her clients are showing interest in reaching Afro-Brazilians, many don't see it as uh, marketing. OK, she said uh, the interest is there. The interest is there, but the money isn't there. This isn't a structural change in Brazilian society, which has proven itself to be racist and sexist. We're just in the beginning. So I'm hoping in 10 years we will see a major change End quote. OK, but they're going to keep they're going to keep this going. I mean, they're having they're having screenings of the film. Screenings are packed with Afro Brazilians. Right. And they're they're un, they're realizing they're they're starting a black money movement because they're inspired by this film. Now these gatherings, I'm going to go back in this article from uh, Courts Africa because they had some additional information that the other articles didn't have. These gatherings are not only celebrations of Black Pride, uh, Black Pride protests against racial exclusion. They were also a positive signal to the mainstream and Afro Brazilians themselves that they could economically support products that represented them on a large scale. Since the debut, uh, since the debut of Black Panther in Brazil, the Black the Black Money movement, the idea that Black Brazilians can use their money to support Black businesses has gained steam and support and has even uh, crossed over into mainstream media. Now compared with African-Americans, Afro-Brazilians have always felt a strong connection to their African roots, okay? Compared with African-Americans, Afro-Brazilians have always felt a very strong connection to their African roots, but their, but their black African pride is rarely celebrated in mainstream society which in this context could be a euphemism for Brazil's white establishment. Now, um, Rodrigo Franco, who I talked about a few minutes ago, he said the success of Black Panther suggests, uh, he said the, su su the success of Black Panther represents uh, and it shows uh, Afro-Brazilians that they could organize for a common goal that was strongly connected to spend the money. He said, quote, for us, the success of Black Panther was a grand example of how much we have to consume. And it also showed the potential of how we can consume products that are related to our representation, products that will represent our culture. So. As, and, and, and I said before, and I know some people just tuned in, so I'll say it again. He went on to say, if we stop buying from racist companies and companies that do not engage in diversity, those companies will not survive. 
So, I mean, what's taking place here is phenomenal. And people are, are realizing the power of their dollars. And see, this is why. So some of you saw the interview I did with Dr. Claude Anderson, February 19th. Right. And it's here on Facebook Live. Go to our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network. Click on videos. We have hundreds of videos there. OK, that you can watch. Um, and, you know, uh, Dr. Claude Anderson is one of my teachers. I've interviewed him a number of times. And he talks about building a economic base and how we have to build an economic base. If you see Hidden Colors 2, he talks about the five story building. Right. And he says the foundation is is economics. He said, build your businesses um, and uh, strengthen your community. And then you leverage the money that you make from your businesses and you buy every politician uh, that, that you need. Uh, so you, so you, you leverage your, your, your money you make from the businesses to uh, impact your politics. OK. And then um, he talks about then gain control of the police departments, gain control of uh, media outlets and uh, gain control of education. Talks about this five story building. Right. Well, I, I contend that there's six stories. The foundation is not economics. The foundation is African history and culture, which gives you your VIPs, your values, your interests and your principles. And it influences your economic empowerment, influences your political empowerment. OK, because, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you have. If that foundation is not in place, you won't know what to do with the money. So the African-American uh, gross domestic product is about one point three trillion dollars a year. But ninety seven percent of our dollars are spent with people that don't look like us because that foundation is not in place. The history and culture, which gives you your values, your interests, and your principles, is not in place. So a lot of times people say, well, the, so a lot of times people just look at the economic base is businesses that you own. I disagree. It's not just businesses that you own. It's where you spend your dollars. It's where you invest your dollars. It's also in um, things that you support, like TV shows and TV networks that you support. You can leverage all of that to push your issues, to push your agenda. If we look at in 2014, late 2014, you had the TV show Sorority Sisters on TV. And a lot of it was on BH1. A lot of people were complaining about the TV show Sorority Sisters because uh, African-American women in sororities like Delta Sigma Theta, Alpha Kappa Alpha, et cetera, Zeta Phi Beta. They were saying that the, that the TV show negatively depicted African-American women and negatively depicted African-American sororities. So so these these organizations got together and they put pressure on the advertisers of this show and 19 advertisers canceled their ads for the show and then that and that show was put on the shelf and you haven't heard anything about it since then this was late 2014 they leveraged their dollars that they spent it wasn't about the businesses that they, that they own it was understanding the power of their dollars and they they organized and they leveraged their dollars that they spent with these corporations to be able to push their agenda if you look at in um, New York City, and I think I have the article here about that, in New York City in uh, late 2017, it was announced that the city employees of New York City were divesting $48 million of pension fund dollars from uh, privatized prisons. OK, because they found out that they were invested in privatized prisons. Read this article here. See, this deals with see, I deal with a concept that I coined called economic guerrilla warfare, economic guerrilla warfare. And the three main principles of economic guerrilla warfare, redistribute, redirect and renegotiate, redistribute the pain of those inflicting pain upon us through targeted, sustained economic withdrawal strategies. And there are various economic withdrawal strategies. It's not just walking in front of a store with a picket sign saying, don't shop here. No, there are various economic withdrawal strategies. When you understand the power that we have, when we understand the tools that we have, then we can actually strategize on how to utilize these tools. This is why my concept of an economic base goes beyond, it goes way beyond just businesses that you own, okay? But I think differently. And I deal with historical examples to back up what I'm talking about.
So if we look at this article here, NYC pension fund to back out of investments in private prisons. NYC, New York City pension funds, pension fund to back out of investments in private prisons, okay? So this is from uh, New York Daily News, and this is something that actually happened. On Politics Nation, Reverend Al Sharpton interviewed uh, somebody who was key uh, in this uh, effort and they dealt with um, they dealt with how they were um, doing this. Okay, so what happened was is they divested forty eight million dollars from three privatized prisons. Okay, so a lot of people don't know that they are invested. A lot of people don't know that they are invested in privatized prisons, and it's through your pension funds is through your 401k funds. You, you, uh, a lot of people are invested in privatized prisons. They're also invested in gun manufacturers, okay? And don't know it. Well, these are things that you can leverage to push agendas, okay? So they said, you may have privatized prisons, but you're not gonna do it with our money. So they found out that they were invested in Geo Group, okay? Which used to be called Whack and Hut. Core Civic, which used to be Corrections Corporation of uh, Corrections Corporation of America, which is the largest owner operator of privatized prisons in the country, and G4S. Now these are three of the top privatized prison companies. Okay, and uh, they divested forty eight million dollars of pension fund dollars from this uh, these privatized prisons. All right. And then we see, so that was, uh, that article's from June 8th, 2017. This is an example of redistributing the pain, understanding the power that you have. This is not business ownership. This is understanding where your dollars are invested. Okay. You got, uh, that's New York Daily News. So we posted the link there. You can check that out. Then you have, um, uh, in 2016, July 15th, 2016, NYC pension fund, promises to dump firearm investments in protest for gun control, okay? And this deals with how uh, uh, New York City employees retirement system, uh, one of the city's five pension, pension boards voted on Thursday to divest from gun companies following a year long push to dump the stocks in protests against lax gun control laws. So they divested money, and I forgot exactly how much it is, but they divested money from gun manufacturers. The over $54 billion fund had 1.4 million shares of stock in Walmart alone last year, worth $109 million. The fund was invested in five big gun retailers, including Dick Sporting Goods, which stopped selling assault rifles, you know, because of Parkland, Parkland, Florida shooting, Dick Five Sporting Goods and Walmart, okay? Read, read this article. See, this is see, these are real examples of redistributing the pain and understanding the power that you have. Now, these are not people owning businesses, these are employees. But this is why my, my concept of an economic base is it goes far beyond just owning businesses. It deals with where you spend your money, where you invest your money, it deals with the type of TV shows you watch, and it deals with the businesses that you own. Okay, I can show you documented evidence of this. There was also an article from the New York Times, July 14th, 2016, New York City pension fund to divest itself of gun retailer stock. This deals with the same thing. OK, if we look at what uh, what just happened recently behind Parkland, we see that with the NRA, we see that at least 20 corporations severed ties with the NRA because they got such a huge backlash from consumers. Consumers were bombarding their social media platforms, telling them to sever ties with the NRA. They were sending emails. They were calling them. Now, these are, these are people, most, most of these people probably don't own businesses, but they spend money with these corporations. So they're leveraging the dollars they spend with these corporations to be able to push their issues. This is real. This is not theory. This is real. This actually happened. OK, if you look at um, I think I have the articles here because I, I have so many articles. If not, I have it bookmarked. Um, if you look at uh, let's see, where is that? I think I just saw it. Uh, Thinkprogress.org had a big uh, a big article dealing with uh, a lot of the. Uh, 
uh, corporations that severed ties with the NRA. They were offering discounts uh, to the NRA, okay? Then you have this whole movement, right? You have this whole movement with the protests, with the school walkouts. So all this is gaining steam. Most of these people are not business owners. The, these corporations are paying attention to the youth. Why? Because these youth are future consumers. And they realize, well, wait a second. See, see, my, my background is in marketing. My degree is in business administration with a major in marketing. Yes, I've been studying history for 25 years, as well as entrepreneurship, economic empowerment, right? But corporations know on average the lifetime value of the average consumer from 18 to 65. They know the life, the, the lifetime, the average lifetime value, how much they're going to spend. So they're saying, well, wait a second, if we make this move here, we can gain these consumers for the rest of their life because we do the right thing. So when we look at um, the article from New York Times, February 26, 2018, February 26, 2018, you might be giving gun companies money even if you don't own a gun. This is real. And a lot of people now I've been dealing with this for, for a few years now talking about this because I have a whole I have a whole lecture called redistributing the pain how African Americans historically fought back with economic boycotts and and I've been talking about for the last few years how a lot of people are invested in privatized prisons and don't know it a lot of people are invested in gun manufacturers but a lot of people are also invested in entertainment companies like Universal Music and Universal who put out negative corporate hip hop. And we're financing our own dehumanization and don't understand it. This is why we have to take our minds back. Many of us are financing gun manufacturers, privatized prisons, and entertainment companies that put out negative corporate hip hop, marketing poison to our youth, and we don't even know it. So, this is why. When we deal with an economic base, when I deal with my concept of an economic base, it goes far beyond just owning businesses. OK, now check out this article here. This is from February 26. This is after the Parkland shooting. Parkland shooting was February 14th, Valentine's Day. You might be giving gun companies money even if you don't own a gun. And this talks about how you might not actually possess a gun. But if you have a pension, a pension fund or a 401k plan or an investment in index funds, there's a good chance that, that directly or indirectly, you own shares of one or more uh, gun manufacturers. Like it or not, that means that your financial incentives are at least partly aligned with those of gun makers. And in general, the more guns they sell, the more money their shareholders, in other words, you make. So it, it goes on to explain this. It deals with pension funds, index funds. A number of state pension funds own shares in the gun makers. For example, pension funds for public employees in Florida, Texas, Wisconsin, and Ohio all have stakes of less than 1% in America outdoor, American outdoor brands, formerly known as Smith & Wesson which is the manufacturer of the AR-15 semi-automatic assault rifle that has been used in a number of recent mass shootings, including Parkland and Sandy Hook in 2012. A lot of people are invested in this company and don't even know it. TIAA, which oversees retirement investments for educators and teachers, has small stakes in American outdoor brands, formerly known as Smith & Wesson, and two other publicly traded gun companies. The pension fund for teachers in New York State, the state of New York, not the city of New York, New York State, also has very small positions in the gun company Sturm Rugger and Vista Outdoor. The investments represent slivers of the pension funds overall assets, but they nonetheless are generating debate. New Jersey lawmakers last week moved to cut off investments in gun makers by the state pension plan. 
So everybody watching, you should check with your benefits manager to find out where your pension fund dollars are invested, where your 401k dollars are invested, which industries are they invested in, which companies. I'm not against pension funds. I'm not against 401k plans. What I'm saying is we need to know where that money is invested. This is why my concept of an economic base goes way beyond owning businesses. It deals with where you, where you spend your money. It deals with where your dollars are invested. And it also deals with the TV shows and the networks that you support. Because when, you, when we actually understand how to leverage all of that, then we can push issues. We can push agendas. But if we, if we don't understand that and how all that works, all we have to do is pay attention and see how corporations are responding to this mass movement of people fighting for common sense gun legislation, common sense gun reform. You've got CBSnews.com. So that article was from New York Times. You might be giving gun companies money even if you don't own a gun. That's from February 26, 2018. You can look at this article from CBS News. This is not Infowars. This is not The Onion. This is not satire. This is real. I've been dealing with this for a few years because, because I followed for three years the California teachers who, in 2012, they found out in California after the Sandy Hook shooting, California, the California teachers have the largest pension fund in the country as far as teachers. Back in 2012, it was valued at $155 billion. They found out that a portion of their pension fund was invested in three gun manufacturers. And they were livid. One of the gun manufacturers was the gun manufacturer that made the Bushmaster AR-15 assault rifle that was used in the Sandy Hook shooting. So I followed the story for three years. And they were able to finally, they, they, they divested from two gun manufacturers earlier. The last one, it took them much longer, but after three years, they were able to divest from all three of these gun manufacturers. That's an example of redistributing the pain. This is not theory. See, I, see, I got a whole lot of people inboxing me, emailing me, talking to me about all types of theory. This ain't theory. These are real documented cases. I don't deal with a bunch of theory. OK, when people come to me with all this theory, I say, OK, now show me where this has worked, because one of the most important things. See, you have some people who say and spend a lot of times talking about what we don't do. OK, that has some merit. Then you have other people who spend a lot of time in writing books about what we should do. OK, that has some merit. Then you have people who spend a lot of time teaching people how to do what we should do. That has some merit. The most important thing I think we can do is to show our people real example, real life documented examples of people actually doing what we say should be done. Because once we have real life examples, number one is no longer theory. Because once it actually, see a theory is something that you believe is true, but you can't prove it. Once it's actually done, it's no longer theory, it's history. So then you can study how they did it and you can replicate it. So the most important thing I think that we can do is to show real life documented examples of everyday people doing extraordinary things and actually doing what we say needs to be done. Because now you can study it and you can replicate it. It's not, it's not that difficult. We just have to take our minds back. Stephen Beagle, one of our great South African freedom fighters, he said the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. The most potent weapon in the hands of the in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So we have to take our minds back. It's not that difficult. It's not going to take 200 years. It's not going to take 100 years. It's not that difficult. OK, seriously, we look at this article here. February 24, 2018, okay? More companies cut ties with the NRA after customer backlash. People were pissed off and they let them know. See, now this is one thing, I, this is one of the things I understand, right? See, white people will let corporations know when they're mad, 
A lot of times African Americans won't. And white people let their politicians know when they're mad also. Now I do, I've been doing radio for eight years. I've done national radio. I've guest hosted the Roland Martin National Radio Show a long time, uh, for, for, for a number of times. Uh, he ended his national radio show December 30th, 2016. I was, uh, uh, I was doing my national radio show, the Michael M. Hotep show on the Empowerment Radio Network. I do radio here in Detroit, 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation. So on Sunday nights, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you tune in here on Facebook and you'll see me in the studio of 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF broadcasting the African History Network show. Right. So one of the things I learned doing radio doing radio here in Detroit, doing national radio, I guess hosted for uh, Warren Ballantyne when he was on the Empowerment Radio Network a lot. When white people get mad, they'll call their politicians and complain. When African-Americans get mad, they call radio stations and complain. You're gonna get more accomplished calling politicians because see, politicians realize those are voters. And when it's the issue, right? And they have to vote on the issue, they keep track of how many phone calls they get. How many phone calls they get that say vote for this issue, vote for this bill, don't vote for this bill. How many emails they get? They keep track of that. When white people get mad now, white people, many white people, they will call radio stations, but they're more likely to call their politicians and complain and voice their opinion. Many African-Americans don't do that. We'll call radio stations. And we'll call and if you listen to some radio shows in your city. You hear some of the same people every day calling in, complaining about the mayor, the city council, the, the county commissioner, all that stuff. Right. Now, did you go vote to vote them out of office? Because, see, we'll go and play the lottery every day, but won't show up and vote once every two or four years to vote these people out of office that we call in the radio shows every day to complain about. So we have to take our minds back. How's everybody doing? All right, hey, if you're just tuning in, hey, this is Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I guess you can tell I'm a talk show host, right? <laughs> so we're talking about how the film Black Panther is influencing the black money movement in Brazil. But we're also talking about how to understand a broader definition of an economic basis because an economic basis is not just businesses that you own. An economic basis is also dealing with uh, where you spend your money, where you invest your money. It's dealing with a number of different things, okay? And I'm showing you documented examples of people leveraging they're understanding their power, leveraging their power to push their issues, to change laws, et cetera, to change policies. This is real. This is not theory. OK. All right. And then also um, I talked about a uh, little bit. Uh, I'm doing uh, an online lecture dealing with the film Black Panther on Saturday, March 31st. I got to update this. this is actually Saturday, March 31st, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Um, is at our online school, the African History Network uh, School. And uh, we'll post a link here again. Um, you can register for that. And we have a six course online bundle pack. All right. So you get you, you register for six of my online courses um, and they're all on demand except for the sixth course, which is the one on Black Panther Saturday, March 31st. OK. And um, uh, that includes uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach in school. It includes great African women in history, the mothers of civilization, African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and how elections have consequences, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was the war on the African-American community is one other one also. OK, so that's a six course online bundle pack. You can watch from around the world. It's eighty dollars, regular one hundred twenty dollars automatically registers you for the online lecture. I'm dealing with the film Black Panther and all these I do a PowerPoint presentation uh, like I do now. This is the technology we use in the class. We have video clips, uh, articles, you have a PowerPoint presentation, everything. So it's visual. OK, it's a visual presentation. All right. Uh, and then also uh, that includes. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. 
okay? And that is a seven session, 14 hour online course that I teach dealing with thousands of years of history, deal with the Moors, of course, the 800 year occupation of Europe. I'm trying to go back to uh, the slide that gives an overview where it's at. Because these are some of the, this, this, this is some of the uh, uh, presentation here. This is some of the class, some of the slides in the class. I'm trying to find, okay, that was one thing I was trying to find right there. So that shows you uh, the six courses in the online bundle pack. But also I wanted to uh, just do briefly a quick overview for a couple of minutes here. Because we do a lot of information in the class. That's why seven sessions in uh, 14 hours. Then there's 20 hours of bonus content also. Okay, for uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach in school. All right. And where is. Here we go. This is what I'm looking for here. OK, so here's some of the things that we look to deal with. What, it, what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play? Columbus. Uh, was instrumental in laying the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism and the exploitation of indigenous people. When did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? When did, Afri uh, did, did Africans sell themselves into slavery? Uh, were African people in America before the transatlantic slave trade? Because yes, we were, because this was our land stolen from us. We were here for at least 51,700 years. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, shocking archeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. So we really deal with a lot of these archeological discoveries that are, that are taking place, okay? because they're they're causing them to have to push back the timelines and push back the dates. There was one archaeological discovery in either June or July of 2017 in Morocco, and they found skeletons of Homo sapiens, modern man, that date back between 300,000 and 350,000 years ago. Now, this is over 100,000 years older than the oldest uh, human remains of Homo sapiens, they found that dated back 195,000 years ago in Ethiopia. This totally caused the, all the, the archaeologists and the scientists, anthropologists, this is totally causing them to rethink everything. And they were saying, we're going to have to start looking for human remains, you know, in areas we never thought to look before. Because if, because, because it, because it was thought, because what they said was, is that we have to realize now that People were uh, migrating out of East Africa much earlier than we had thought. So Juvenile had a song in 1997, 1998 called Back That Thing Up. When these discoveries take place, they keep having to back that thing up. They keep having to back the dates up. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets. The more research they do, the older we get. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets. The more research they do, the older we get. All right. So how's everybody doing? How y'all like this type of information? If you like this type of information, uh, you may want to register for the uh, online courses that I teach. We have a, a online bundle pack. You go register for them individually. Uh, you click on the link here and post it again. Uh, you can the bundle pack is the best value is eighty dollars, regular hundred twenty dollars. It's all six classes, and it automatically registers you for the uh, on the uh, Black Panther online class, online lecture I'm doing Saturday, March thirty first, two thousand eighteen, two p.m. to four p.m. All these you can watch over and over and over again. They're on demand. You can watch them over and over and over again as well. Okay, so if you go to a lecture, right, you pay ten fifteen dollars, you watch it once here. You can watch these over and over. You can watch them every day for the next two years if you want to. OK. <laughs> All right. So uh, we deal with uh, in how insurance we took to deal with how insurance companies took out insurance policies, not just on slave ships and the cargo on the ships, the enslaved Africans on the ships, but also enslaved Africans on the plantations. See, that's something that's not talked about a lot because there are at least 262 skills, trades and crafts that African people had in this country from uh, 1619 to 1865. And these skills, trades, and crafts were used to build the country, okay? And uh, I'll show you a few of them here. Let's see, because I have, uh, this, uh, we deal with this in the class. We talk about the New York Life Insurance Company founded in the spring of 1845. 
And uh, New York Life Insurance Company started out as the Nautilus Mutual Life Insurance Company. And um, their first three years, they sold 508 policies on enslaved Africans. Now, the majority of their business, only about a third of their business, like the first three years, was on enslaved Africans. And according to their records, they didn't really make a big profit off of it. But what it did was it gave them inroads into the South to sell more policies, you know, to white slave owners, things like this for for for, for white people. OK, for Europeans, as opposed to on enslaved Africans. But you had over in this country, you had over 40 insurance companies that took out insurance policies on slaves on the plantations. Because contrary to popular belief, contrary to maybe what you see in the movie Gone with the Wind, um, enslaved Africans did more than just pick cotton and cook the master's food and take care of the master's children. There were at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country. Now, if you look at the book called uh, The Other Slaves, Crafts, Artisans, The Other Slaves, Mechanics, Artisans, and Craftsmen by James Newton and Ronald Lewis in 1978. They list the skilled trades and crafts there, right? And I knew about some of these uh, from one of the sources was uh, the book, um, How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy, by uh, which was put out by the Nation of Islam Research Group, okay? But what happened was, I'm a member of the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History here in Detroit the Charles H. Wright Museum of African-American History here in Detroit. So I was at the museum one day and I, I've, I've done lectures at the museum. I know um, a lot of the people at the museum, they know me as well. Um, I was at the museum one day and I was going through the, the main display, which deals with, uh, it deals with ancient Africa. It deals with uh, the uh, great West African kingdoms. It deals with Africa right before the transatlantic slave trade. Then it deals with the transatlantic slave trade. And they have a replica of a slave ship and you go through and they have history about what happened on a slave ship, things like this. And then you come out and they deal with uh, uh, life as an enslaved African on the plantation. And you see uh, statues of uh, they have information on Frederick Douglass and the statue of Frederick Douglass. They have one of Harriet Tubman, things like this. But they have this big um, uh, display on the wall. And this information is on that display, okay? And it talks about crafts, artisans, skills, slaves, uh, crafts, artisans, and skills slaves had prior to 1865. And they list all 262 of them. So there was a sign there that said, you can't take pictures, right? So I spent an hour writing them down and then I numbered them. Because they weren't numbered. I spent an hour writing them down and I numbered them. That's how I know the 262. But here are some of the ones uh, and they're in alphabetical order. So this is what I could get on the page, on the slide. This, this is 23 of them. Anchor makers. So, these, so enslaved Africans were anchor makers, artists, bakers, barrel makers, bartenders, basket makers. Beer makers, blacksmiths, bricklayers, brick makers, cabinet makers, cigar makers, cooks, coppersmiths, decorative furnishers, fishermen, engineers, gardeners, hemp baggers. Now, hemp is the fiber of the marijuana plant, cannabis, because that was legal. That was that was legally grown. That was a crop that was grown. Herb doctors. Horse trainers, hunters, locksmiths. These are just a few. When you study the building of the White House in Washington, D.C., the White House in Washington, D.C., and the U.S. Capitol building, the bulk of the labor that built the White House in the U.S. Capitol building was enslaved African labor and free African Americans. Now, what's interesting is, is that information really came out and it was either June or July 2016 at the Democratic National Convention. And Michelle Obama gave her 14 minute speech. And Michelle Obama. And I'm really re I'm, I really miss that sister's first lady. I ain't going to go deep into it, but I miss Michelle Obama's first lady. Um, 
she talked about waking up in a uh, house built by slaves. Well, that night on social media, many white people, not all white people, but you had some white people that lost their ever loving minds. They said she was a liar. They said she was race baiting. How dare you bring up slavery? All this stuff. Now, this was nationally televised. Millions of people saw this. So you think that Michelle Obama, the first lady, now not this current first lady, Michelle Obama, you think Michelle Obama is going to stand here on national television, millions of people seeing this, and you think she's deliberately going to tell a lie that's easy to verify. Not the current first lady that won't check her husband for cyberbullying. But she wants to engage. She wants to fight against cyberbullying. You need to start with the person in the White House. OK, so what happened was all the, a bunch of articles that night. A bunch of articles were written that talked about how the bulk of the labor that built the White House was uh, came from enslaved Africans and uh, free African-Americans. And then. Um, a couple of nights, either the next night or a couple of nights after that, Bill O'Reilly, when he had his show on the Fox News Network, The O'Reilly Factor, because it was African-Americans, they helped take his show out. See, that deals with leveraging. I'm going to talk about that example in just a minute. That deals with leveraging our dollars. That deals with leveraging, understanding our, our real economic base. I'll talk about that in just a minute. He did a segment where he dealt with the history coming from the White House Historical Society, and he said Michelle Obama was correct. Well, we know she's correct. I'm glad he did it to calm down some of those ignorant people who were lying and going on social media, showing they don't understand history, but it's not their fault. They're miseducated. We have to understand. White supremacy purposely miseducates the masses so they can keep groups of oppressed people fighting against one another, okay? So just so you understand that I wasn't playing, this is it. Now, this is a copy of it because I don't take the original out the house. I don't take the original out the office. But this is this is a copy of what I wrote down. Right. Those owned by skilled tradesmen learned their master's crafts. Directory of occupation. Oh, so this was a directory of occupation held by black artists. Uh, and this was skills held by black artists as a craftsman. OK. And it, and it says, uh, so this is called, if you go to the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in Detroit, 315 East Warren Avenue in Detroit, right off of I-75 Freeway, Warren, right down the street from Wayne State University, my alma mater, a working life, African American occupations. So I did this uh, July 13th, 2012, because I date everything, okay? This is page one. This is page two, 147. This is page two. This is page three. Bam, 262. This is page three. See, mo see, see, this is why a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past and the future to meet the needs of the community because things happen in cycles. So many people don't understand. So, th so this is why you have to understand the chronology of history. Because what happened was after slavery ends with the end of the, the, end of the Civil War, June 2nd, 1865, the 13th Amendment ratified December 6th, 1865. It's adopted December 18th, 1865. So this is what officially ends slavery. It wasn't the, it wasn't the Emancipation Proclamation, June 1st, 1863. No, that was a military strategy to uh, um, label the enslaved Africans that were in the Confederacy that the that the Confederacy was using to dig the dishes and cook the food and wash the clothes. They labeled them contraband, right? And it's going to be the Thirteenth Amendment that actually frees the enslaved Africans. But what's going to take place? Well, number one, you have a terrorist organization that's that's formed December uh, December twenty fourth, eighteen sixty five, in Pulaski, Tennessee, called the Ku Klux Klan which is going to terrorize um, uh, formerly enslaved African-Americans. They terrorize Republicans, black Republicans and white Republicans because the Republicans were seen as the enemy. OK, because 
Um, the uh, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican and the Republican Party was formed in 1854 by groups of abolitionists. So it was the Republican Party that was looked at as the party that freed enslaved Africans. OK, the Democratic Party was largely the party of the plantation owners, the party of the Southerners. All right. So you had the Ku Klux Klan. They targeted uh, African-Americans, the former slaves, black Republicans, white Republicans and Jews. This is the, this, the, the, the Ku Klux Klan targeted all of them. Now, the majority of the people they killed, of course, were African American, but they targeted all of them. Right after slavery ends, then you start having these large labor unions created, like the National Labor Union in 1866 and the American Federation of Labor around 1875. Shortly after slavery ends, why? Because now that African people are free, and our skills were as good as, or in many cases, better than white people and the white immigrants coming to this country. Now we can compete for wages. Now these labor unions are created to lock us out of these jobs that we had done for the last 246 years for free. And they're having contracts with well, industries saying that you can only hire white men that belong to these unions. Now, I'm not against labor unions. I'm against white supremacy and racism and discrimination in labor unions. So this is why you have to understand a chronology of history. OK. All right. Now. How's everybody doing? So everybody look, share this broadcast on your own Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also because you ain't going to get this type of information a lot of other places. I'm not. I mean, OK, I shouldn't say that. All right. But anyway, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? OK. <laughs> and then also, um, if you like this type of information, register for the online courses that I teach. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach in the school. We have a six uh, course bundle pack. Six of my online courses for eighty dollars. Uh, it includes the Black Panther online lecture that I'm going to do live Saturday, March 31st. Uh, 2018, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's uh, it's on our, um, I have an online school, the African History Network School, so it's not on uh, Facebook. But the uh, five courses are on demand. You can start watching as soon as you register. That includes the one dealing with the transatlantic slave trade. And then um, the one with Black Panther, uh, that will, after we do it live, it'll be on demand. You can go back and watch it over and over again, okay? And you can register for the courses individually if you want to. Uh, we posted the information here on the thread. You can click on the link for that. And then also you can go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. OK, information is right on the home page. You can register there. OK, but this uh, uh, the online course I do dealing with the uh, transatlantic slave trade. It's uh, seven sessions. It's broken up into seven sessions. It's 14 hours. And there's 20 hours of bonus content. OK, all these you can watch from around the world. You can watch on your smartphone, your tablet or your computer, of course. OK. All right. Um, and then those in the Detroit area, I will be speaking at Wayne State University Thursday, March 22nd, 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. in the old main building, 480 West Hancock, uh, 480 West Hancock uh, in Detroit on uh, uh, Wayne State's uh, campus. Um, and uh, they're, they're, they're going to show a documentary called Stars of the Pharaohs. Uh, this deals with uh, astronomy in ancient Egypt. And I'll, we'll do a discussion and I'll do a short presentation dealing with the film Black Panther. It's free and open to the public. Visit AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com for more information on that. And then also those in the Baltimore area. I'll be at the 17th annual Baltimore Natural Hair Care Expo. Uh, Saturday, April 7th, Sunday, April 8th at the UMBC uh, Center, I think it is, Event Center. We have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, I'm doing a workshop that Saturday, uh, Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization, that Saturday. Don't know the time yet. And then I have a, um, I have a vendor booth there both days. So come on out, check me out, okay? All the information is on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. So let's continue. So I was talking about um, Bill O'Reilly. OK. 
And we really need to study why Bill O'Reilly's show was taken off of the air. Because many of us don't understand. African-Americans had a lot to do with it. It was the uh, organization colorofchange.org, colorofchange.org. They were at the forefront. And they organized uh, Color of Change and they worked with other organizations. And they put pressure on 80 advertisers uh, to withdraw their advertising dollars from Bill O'Reilly's show, The O'Reilly Factor. And Fox News fired him. Now, the color change had a campaign for two years against the O'Reilly factor because Bill O'Reilly was uh, he would speak very negatively by African-Americans, speak negatively about the Black Lives Matter movement. It, you know, it was just horrific. So. Uh, when he, when Bill O'Reilly went after Maxine Waters. Congresswoman Maxine Waters. And uh, he said he couldn't hear what she was saying because her hairstyle looked like a James Brown hairstyle. The movement against his show that the uh, color of change had, um, it gained steam. Then the article from the New York Times came out about Bill O'Reilly and Fox News paying $13 million to settle five sexual harassment lawsuits. Then it really took off. OK. Uh, Color change got uh, they got something like three hundred twenty five thousand uh, signatures on an online petition. But they and other organizations they work with, they contacted, contacted dozens of corporations that advertised on Bill O'Reilly's show. And he had like the number one cable news uh, show for like 13 years, the O'Reilly Factor, the, the O'Reilly Factor. And they got 80 advertisers to pull their advertising dollars from the O'Reilly factor. The show was no longer profitable for Fox and Fox fired him. Now he's doing a podcast. That's power. That's understanding the power that you have. This is why I say the concept of an economic basis. See, a lot of people talk about an economic basis and they just deal with businesses that we own. An economic basis for my analysis is much larger than just businesses you own or we own. It deals with where we invest our money, where we spend our money, leveraging our dollars when it comes to the TV shows we watch and putting pressure on advertisers. That's a documented case. You can read this article right here of Post Black Voices. This deals with it. Uh, is called uh, This Black Org, O-R-G, helped oust Bill O'Reilly by hitting Fox where it hurts. Money talks, bigots walk, bigot walks by Zahara Hill. Okay, this is from uh, April 24, 2017. This Black Org, O-R-G, organization, helped oust Bill O'Reilly by hitting Fox where it hurts. And uh, in the article, now, this is real. This is a real example. This is not theory. This is not something you have to study for 15 years. You don't have to wait for all the stars to line up there for Mercury to be in retrograde. You don't have to wait for, you know, the age of Aquarius to come and all this stuff. No, this is some real stuff. This is some real economic guerrilla warfare. When, when, when you study the Haitian Revolution, they engaged in guerrilla warfare, 1791 to 1803. Watch the documentary 1804, The Hidden History of Haiti from director Tariq Nasheed, who is the director of the Hidden Colors films. They engaged in guerrilla warfare. There's a sister in there who's a Haitian historian. She said that they used their surroundings, okay? If you had a rock and you sat on a rock, your butt covered that rock, and when the time came, you got up, you grabbed that rock and you hit your oppressor upside the head. They used what they had. So just as the Haitians engaged in guerrilla warfare to gain their freedom, we must engage in economic guerrilla warfare. We must engage in economic guerrilla warfare. So when Fox News failed to hold former anchor Bill O'Reilly accountable for his prejudicial banter on the network, color of change, the organization Color Change, a racial justice advocacy group, decided to organize against O'Reilly and his platform. 
The organization which dedicates itself to issues of racial inequality took issue with Bill O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly's ongoing race baiting, particularly a 2006 broadcast in which he claimed he was attacked during the L.A. riots. So they go uh, they go on to say, but for months prior to O'Reilly's comments about uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, a wave of allegations that he sexually harassed former Fox employees began to make headlines. After these allegations were made public, a former black Fox employee came forward alleging that Bill O'Reilly um, uh, grunted at her like a wild boar and addressed her as hot chocolate, addressed her as hot chocolate. OK. Let's continue here. OK, so they talk about how uh, when he goes after when he went after Maxine Waters, they added momentum. The campaign became more effective in persuading companies to pull their advertisements from the program just two weeks ago. So this is uh, April of 2017. Just two weeks ago, Nutrisystem uh, told Color Change that they had no plans to buy ad time during the O'Reilly factor after corresponding with the organization. Read this article. This is an example of economic guerrilla warfare. It's not just the businesses you own. It's understanding how to leverage the dollars that you spend with corporations to push your agenda, to attack networks, to attack shows that attack us, negatively depict us. This is, this is serious. This is something that happened. This is a real life example, okay? So read this article here also. All right. So um, the black money movement in Brazil is something that's real, is growing. We need to do the same thing here. And many people are doing the same thing here in this country. Uh, you, you, I've dealt with articles on my show, the African History Network show, that deals with how the, the impact that the film Black Panther is having on African-American businesses, businesses that sell African garb, African books, all different types of things like that. It's, it's fantastic. OK. Uh, let me try to go to some of your comments here quickly. OK. Vi said why the coalition of black trade unionists was started uh, and why a Philip Randolph started the Porter's Union. Yeah. Brotherhood, uh, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. OK. Uh, excellent as a staunch unionist. I make sure that others know the true history of unions. TULC, Trade Union Leadership uh, Council in Detroit, used to be very, very strong. Uh, Denise, I also share your web page. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll post the link here again uh, for the um, online courses I teach. And all of them are on demand except for the one on Black Panther because that's coming up on uh, uh, Saturday, May 31st, 2018. But as soon as you register for these, you can start watching. The one for Black Panther, that's $10 if you do it individually. And as soon as, you, as soon as you register, there's a video there you can watch. Uh, I'm talking about an aspect of the film. But uh, that's Saturday, uh, March 31st, 2018, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And after I do a live, it'll be on demand. All these you can watch over and over again as well. Shalanda, uh, okay, Cameron's a native black. Uh, Jesse. I'm glad you are known by all those magnificent and wonderful people. So you are a baller, but are you a shot caller? Um, all right. If you have any questions, go ahead and post them here. Also, be sure to visit our, uh, also sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T uh, to sign up for our email newsletter. Okay, we send an email newsletter out. Uh, few times a week, uh, four or five times a week. We have a lot of information in there. We have articles, we have uh, information on where I will be speaking, information on our radio shows, uh, when we upload podcasts, we send that stuff out also, okay? So let's see here, uh, what do we leave off here? This is some of the, I was, also showing you some of the information we cover in the online course that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. OK, so um, we dealt with that. All right. 
We talk about some of the origins of negative stereotypical images that we see of ourselves in the media. These were also used to justify slavery. This is one of them here. This is T.D. Rice, Thomas Dartmouth Rice, who's known as the father of the minstrel shows. He created the Jim Crow character in, um, uh, hold on, I got the wrong thing there. He created the Jim Crow character in 1828, 1829, okay? And um, he's the one who basically creates the minstrel shows. The minstrel shows become the largest, the, one of the most popular forms of entertainment in the country, not just in the South, but in the North, okay? And then after the Jim Crow character, you get the mammies and the sambos and things like this, all right? And they're used to... Um, show African-Americans as being buffoons, show us as being ignorant, docile, obedient, and to justify slavery. The South is, the South creates this image of the happy slave, okay? The South creates this image and the concept of the happy slave. They're using these images to justify this, okay? And the argument that the South is making and it, we really see this right coming from uh, the minstrel shows, and and because see, you're going to have as time goes on, you're going to have a growing uh, abolitionist movement. We see it with um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's book Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852, um, and the character of Uncle Tom was based upon the real life of a, a runaway slave named Josiah Henson, who. Um, runs away from a plantation in Maryland and he goes up uh, north and goes into Canada and he becomes a Methodist minister and an educator and he um, becomes, um, uh, he gets involved with the Underground Railroad. He becomes an abolitionist, okay? So he writes an autobiography and Harriet Beecher Stowe reads his autobiography and she bases the character of Uncle Tom after Josiah Henson. So the fictitious character of Uncle Tom is based upon a real life person, okay, Josiah Henson. If you watch the episode of uh, the Jeffersons, where uh, Louise Jefferson's uh, either cousin or uncle, um, who was a butler, he's played by the guy who played Alderman Davis on Good Times, a tall, bald headed, light skinned guy, right? Um, George said that this guy was uppity and sadity and talk proper, things like this, right? And George uh, called him an Uncle Tom. And then he told George who the real Uncle Tom was. He talked about Josiah Henson because the white man who he was a butler for had a library in his home and let him read books, okay? So if you saw that episode of the Jeffersons, you've heard the name Josiah Henson before. You may not just you may not remember. All right. So um, this is where the fictitious character of Uncle Tom comes from in the novel. It's a novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. So you have things like that. You have the uh, abolitionist party. You have the uh, Republican Party uh, formed in 1854, which is a, a party of abolitionists. And um, this was a political party uh, to be the counter to the Democratic Party. Uh, the Whig Party was, um, let me see, you had the Nativist Party, the Know Nothing Party, 1830s, 1840s. If you saw my presentation dealing with the history of St. Patrick's Day and how the Irish became white, I talked about that. That was a political party organized by a lot of poor whites who blamed immigrants for taking their jobs and a lot of uh, Irish, because the Irish were coming in, uh, a lot of Irish were coming in starting in 1845 because of the Irish potato famine that hit in 1845 in Ireland. So you have about a million Irish who are coming to this country. Um, so you have to understand the chronology of history. And, and, and this is one of the things we do in the classes. We deal with things chronologically. We talk about the uh, three great West African kingdoms, uh, Ghana, Shanghai, and Mali. Uh, as well, we'll talk about the Moors. There's a lot that we deal with in the class, okay? So, um, once again, I'm gonna show you this quick. Oh, here's Stephen Beacon, one of our great South African freedom fighters. He said, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. The most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed, okay? So we have to take our minds back. We have to understand this. We have to take our minds back. We don't have to ask permission to take our minds back, we just have to do it. 
All right. Um, so let me show you this again here. Let's see where is that. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we deal with uh, in the six online course bundle pack, uh, and it's also at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You get ancient Kemet the Moors and the Ma'a for understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. That is uh, broken up into seven sessions, 14 hours, and there's 20 hours of bonus content. You get um, Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization, How Richard Nixon's War on Drugs is a War on the African American Community. African American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and how elections have consequences. Uh, you're automatically registered for the um, Black Panther online class I'm doing on uh, uh, Saturday, March 31st, uh, 2 p.m. to uh, 4 p.m. We'll probably run over. We'll probably run uh, longer than uh, <laughs> uh, two hours. I'll see if I can do it all in two hours, but. I'm looking at the information I have now. I think we're going to run longer than two hours. And uh, Empire Strikes Black, the propaganda of the media. Okay. All right. So how's everybody doing? Uh, Joffrey said America is a hypocritically paradoxical. Ali's greatest regret was turning my back on my brother. Consumers don't love their children. Give more than you take. Well, Ali regretted turning his back on Muhammad Ali. Ali stayed in the nation of Islam. He regretted turning his back on uh, Muhammad Ali. Okay. All right. So everybody share this broadcast on your own Facebook page. You can go back and watch this again. Follow us on Twitter, the AHN Show, the AHN Show on Twitter. Uh, follow our Facebook fan page, uh, the African History Network. The African History Network um, at our website, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You know we have um, 800 audio podcasts of, uh, of our radio shows, and then on our YouTube channel, our YouTube channel. Uh, follow me on YouTube, Michael M Hotel. I M H O T E P on YouTube as well. We have 700 video clips. I think it is there. 700, almost 800 video clips. Okay. Um, uh, Willie said, I love the way you espouse your topics, points of interest. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hey guys, look, we got to get out of here. Hey, remember at the African history network, we at the African history network, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you have been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Remember, right now, let's correct wrong behavior. It's not over until we win. Wakanda forever. Mom, hotel. We'll talk to you next time. Peace. <laughs>